Good morning. If everyone will find their places. We are just a fellowship and group, aren't we? I know. We're right on time. Right on time. All is well with my soul. Very grateful that we didn't get a bunch of really bad stuff yesterday with the weather. A lot of it was it was definitely noisy in in the valley. Just kept rumbling and rumbling and rumbling. I know there's some places throughout the United States that had a difficult time with that storm. So I just wanted to let you all know that we're doing things a little differently with the open mic, but just for right now, just suffice it to say that we're clo the open mic is closed until we open it. Of course, that does not um, include prophecy. Prophecy always has um, preeminence. And so, but we'll talk more about that later. What I do want to do this morning is I want to um, just, just have some praise and worship time, if that's okay, and we can talk a little later. Yay, yeah, yeah, I like that idea too. I'm, 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 I'm excited. So with that, let's go ahead and get our hearts in that place that we want to, I just pray that God, right now, in the name of Jesus, Father, that you'd stir up the gifts within your people. Father, that you have a special word for each and every person here today something they're asking you about or something they, they just really want to hear from you about. And I'm asking, Father, that you do that for them. If not, that's okay too. But if, if they're really their hearts are before you, I ask, Father, that you would just stir that up within them so that they have a confirmation by your word, your spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. But in, in the flow of what God puts on your heart, whether or not it's music, whether or not it's your speech, whether or not it's how you interact with people, we have to be willing and able to adapt to what he wants us to do or say or be. Most of us in our growing up got situated and comfortable in a particular way of doing, speaking, and acting and how we think. And that may not necessarily be how God wants you to think, speak, and act in a circumstance. And whatever we're used to doing, we have to prepare in our hearts to change that to match what God wants us to do. Now, this may be for me, it may be for you, it may be for who watches this on TV or on the internet. Who knows? I, I, I can't answer that, but I know for certain there are things in each of our lives we need to learn to adapt to God instead of expecting him to adapt to us. That's the change we're supposed to make. We can set out our plan. We can have it going, this is what I want to do and how I want to say it and all that kind of stuff. And that's great. But scripture says not to be concerned about what you're going to say. He's going to give you what you need to say at that circumstance. So what we may have thought about may not be what he had in mind. Each of us, none of us like change. None of us do. Even those of us who say we do, no, we don't really like change. We've gotten comfortable in a particular way of doing things. But we've got to learn. I mean, if we're going to really sing the next song called I Give You, it's, I Give you My Heart, if we're going to sing that song, I've always been a firm believer is if you're going to sing it, you better believe it or mean it in your heart. If not, just sit there quietly. Because if we're going to be able to do this and give God our heart in every circumstance, then we've got to be able to change to what he wants us and how he wants us to say it and do it. Cool? We good? Roll on. Um. In such a way that, you know, that song talks about how he will come and back to judge the living and the dead. 
and I'm hearing Henry saying things like this, well, the Father's going to judge the ones that don't receive him, but the Lord Jesus is going to judge those that are his. So, I, so I'm hearing that, so I just wanted to say that that's true. And how awesome is it that Jesus is going to judge us? Okay, because we're in a relationship with him, not that we're not in a relationship with the Father, because we can now through Jesus, but Jesus really feels very responsible for his bride, as he should. And so he is taking that responsibility, I believe, by saying, Father, I got this. These are mine. Amen? And it's interesting, the government of God. Um, wow. I mean, I've heard about it from the day I ever stepped foot in Henry Wright's church and didn't quit hearing about it the day he left. So the government of God is super, super important for all of us. So with that being said, I just want to just kind of segue into a few things, and then I'm going to get in the Word in a minute. But the elders, and we've all met together, and we decided something about the open mic. And not that it's going to cease to exist, because it certainly is. But you all have been trained, except for maybe those attending WOW or whatever, but, but you all have been trained for many years to be able to hear God for yourselves and also for the body, okay? So before, we've, we've had a season where the, we have had deacons or elders that would sit back there and they would listen to what you had to basically make sure it fit in the flow, make sure it was really something you should be sharing um, at this time, and they would check you if, you if they didn't feel so, okay? So we're not going to do that anymore. We believe that you're old enough in God and in, this, in the ways of this, this body that you have the ability to hear God or not hear God, what, either way. And we are going to let you come and tell us what you have, and we're just simply going to give you the card to come and sit up here and be waited on to see what happens. Now, that might make you excited or it might freak you out. I don't know. Because that means that you don't get to run it through somebody's filter. It means you and God have run it through the filter, okay? So that means that there's a possibility that you might come over here and you say something and we don't bear witness. That's happened before. We all live through it, right? We will continue to do so. But that, but, so that means that you have to have a maturity to be able to hear, uh, that wasn't quite where we needed to go, whatever. And of course, if you have questions about that, we'll have an elder who will either speak with you or we'll just do it right here and now, which I think is helpful for everyone to learn. Um, so the other thing with this is that we're not, we're going to decide up here, the elders are going to take the responsibility for the flock, which we should be doing, and we are going to decide whether it's open back there or not. Sometimes God just wants us to say something. Sometimes he just wants us to worship. Who knows? You know, it's up to the Holy Spirit being led through here. We're giving him that. Now, that, that also, I have to tell you that that brings a lot of responsibility back on the elders, too. So this is a responsibility we're all going to share. And the fact that you're going to hear and you're going to go back and get your card, come up here, you're going to be right on. Whew, that'll be fantastic. And that's probably going to happen more times than not. But there is that possibility, as we're learning, that we might miss the mark just a bit. So there's that. Then there's also the, we might, you might all be lined up here, ready to be called on. But the Spirit of God is moved. We are supposed to be hearing that, okay? Not just the elders, but you too, okay? But I will say that we will be the filter for that. So you might be all lined up over there ready to speak and the Spirit of God has just changed or we're just so full of what we've already heard, we need to actually have time to digest that, that maybe adding any more wonderfulness to the meal is just going to make us sick. Okay, you know how that is. So we don't want to be gluttonous either. So, so with that being said, we might just say, somebody up here, one of the elders might say, I, I, I'm, I, I'm sure you had something amazing, but we're done. Or it may be you're sitting there going, I, don't, I think I'm not supposed to say what I was going to say because the Holy Spirit moves. 
okay? He just doesn't come and slam something on us. That's not, he moves and breathes among us. And maybe there was a time, oh, they got that. Now we've got to move on to something else, okay? So we have to give him the ability to do that. So is, uh, so is everyone understand that? So uh, there might be some rejection issues that could pop up, but you know what to do about those too. So we're, I really believe, the elders really believe that you are mature enough to do this. So we're, where the hand holding is removed now, and we're going to see how that goes. Of course, as I said earlier, prophecy always has preeminence. We could be in the middle of anything, and God just wants to come in and say something, and that's going to be okay because we're going to let him do that. Now, remembering this, you should not be prophesying out of your own spirit either. This has to be something that you really believe that God is saying, not just an attaboy, not just, yeah, yeah, exclamation point, just remember to be really spirit-led. Now, I was saying that, I don't want to stifle anybody, because we can learn, okay? But we really, really believe this is the season of maturity. We believe you're there. I believe you're there. The elders believe you're there. So does everyone understand that? We're in a new season. No fear and no fraud, amen? All right. So with that, I want to share just a little bit that God laid on my heart this week. And I really wondered if I wanted to even say anything about it, because, you know, I want, to, I want fresh. I want it to be fresh and, 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 and right there with you all, too. I don't want to give you something that's pre-planned and all that kind of stuff. I want to make sure I was hearing something. Um, I've been hanging out in, with Paul a lot lately. I have to be honest, Paul was not somebody I really wanted to hang out with a lot. He's an interesting individual. I'm sure Henry and him are getting along great. Or maybe there could be some things he's probably going, Paul, why did you say that? Okay. I'm pretty sure he'll do that too. If that is allowed to happen there, that's probably happening. So I'm going to uh, 2 Corinthians 7. And just as kind of came, I was listening, and something stopped me. when I, I was like, whoa, i got to hear that again. i got to hear that again. You ever do that? It's like, i gotta, I got to read that again. i got to hear that again. What was he saying? So, and I hope it fits right in with kind of what I just talked about and maybe what Pastor Benny might have talked about, although I was not here. And Paul, in, in 2 Corinthians, <clears throat> He starts out by saying, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, and that's all that's up there in six, which I'm not going to talk about right now. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. <clears throat> well, you just sang about that kind of. You said, you know, basically you wanted to be, have a clean heart. You want to yield to him. You want to live for him. So that's really what this is about, you know, doing that. But you have to do something. You have to cleanse yourself. You guys all know that. You can't just sit on your blessed assurance. You've got to actually apply the word of God. So then Paul goes into, he's going to meet with these, this group of people. And he previously sent a letter to them. And it was a hard letter because something had happened within their midst that something needed disciplined about. And, and Paul talks about how he, he's paving the way. He said, receive us, because we have wronged no man, and we have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. Oh, there it is, defrauded. <laughs> so basically he's saying, receive us, because whatever you might have heard about us, we didn't do anything, okay? He said, I, we're, we're, we're good. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. So he's definitely dedicated to this group of people. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I'm exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. So we had a difficult time in Macedonia. Without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. So Titus seems to be a real pivotal point here. So Titus must have been a, a really interesting person too. And from what I'm going to read, he must have been a very uplifting person as well. There's something about Titus that he, Paul was really glad to have him there. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. 
When he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me so that I rejoice the more. So we're all happy. Verse 8. For, the, for though I made you sorry with a letter, I did not repent. In other words, I'm, I'm not sorry I sent the letter. Though I did repent. Now, when you look up that repent, it's not like he wished he hadn't done it. He was, he'll, he's going to talk about this part of repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry. So he didn't want them to be sorry, though it were but for a season. So it bummed them out. Okay, they got this letter, they didn't like it, they, they were saddened in some way because of what Paul had said. But now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, not that you were like, you know, downed and out, but that you sorrowed to repentance. In other words, whatever he said in that letter to them, they went, huh. I'm sorry to hear we did that or have done that. And if you go into more about what this situation is about, which I'm not going to go into it about right now, there needed to be some repentance. Now, I rejoice. Woohoo! Not that you were made sorry, not that you were saddened by what I said, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner. Now, you know we've talked about this, and we certainly talked about it in marriage conference, that just saying I'm sorry is not enough. That, that doesn't mean anything to God. That just means that's the world's way of dealing with something they got caught doing. Okay, that's the way the world does that. I'm sorry. I, or even I apologize, you know. but that you sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us and nothing. In other words, the, the words that he said to them was not supposed to bring a condemnation word. It's supposed to bring an honest, this is what happened, what are you going to do about it? So it brought with them, because they were seeking God just like we sang about, it brought godly sorrow which led to repentance. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. So in other words, you don't have to repent of that, but the sorrow of the world worketh death because they don't ever deal with anything. They're just covering it over with some kind of word that just creates, to me, I look at it and it's like you get a craterous wound on your, on your flesh and when you say you're sorry, you just slap a Band-Aid on it and call it healed. When deep within the tissue, there's still a festering that's happening, and it never gets dealt with. And in fact, one of the, the cross-references to this part is, a, is, you know, the merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth up the bones. That's what the cross-reference even went to. And I went, wow. And that's what the world is living in. And Paul is saying, you should not be doing that. So if we behold, for verse 11, for behold the selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Paying attention. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. And all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear of this matter. Through repentance, you're cleared of this matter. Now, honestly, I was listening to all of this, and I was like, yeah, I get it, Paul. I'm, awesome. I'm on it. I love it. Yes, this is good. But the funniest part of this is what struck me. Verse 12, wherefore, though I write unto you, I did it not for his cause. That means the person that had done wrong, that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffereth wrong. I didn't, do, I didn't write this letter for either one of you. That's not why I wrote the letter. Not to make somebody own up, somebody take responsibility, or because you were saddened or hurt by what had happened. But that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. Are you getting that? The only reason why Paul wrote this was not to make this right or make this right with people. 
He wanted them to make it right with God and also for them to see that Paul cared for them so much that he wrote a letter that was really hurtful for him to write. He didn't want to write a letter telling them, pay attention, you guys messed up, you, should, you need to make this right. He didn't want, how many of you as parents have ever had to go through that? You had to say something to a child, but you didn't want to say something to the child, but you had to say something to the child so that they could be righted in their wrong, so they could go in the right direction. Well, that's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, I did this, this writing of this, not for, you know, for two people to come together and say, you were wrong and, 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 and you need to make it right. And he wasn't doing it for that. He wasn't doing for any reason of the flesh. He was doing it for their spirit, man. He was wanting them to see that godly repentance is freedom. And then the thing that just grabbed me, because I don't like to reprimand anybody. If anybody likes to do that, they're not, they're not godly, okay? But does that mean we have to do it? Yes, it does. We must do it because if we don't, then you're not seeing God's care at all. Parents, that's why you do it. It's not because you want to make your children obey for you. You want to make your children obey for him. That's why our motives should, that's what our motives should be. And I know we get caught up in the moment. It doesn't feel like that. And that's why I think the songs that we set, sang today was really appropriate because it's like, I want to live for you. So everything that I do is really about you. So Paul being a very interesting individual, is basically saying, I wrote this letter, I know that you guys didn't like it. I, I'm, he wasn't apologizing for it, but he was saying that the, one of the, the main reasons is that they would repent, but number two, that God's care through him would be visible, and restoration happened. So it's kind of funny because I hadn't thought about, about it really going with the open mic situation, but it really does. So if you see us having to say something, it's not because, um, because you're wrong or, or even the body does need to protect it from wrong doctrine. I'm not saying that that's not a case, but it's also that you can see our care for you. How many places have been silent in the midst of air? more than we can ever count. Now, I'm going to say we're not going to do this perfect as elders or even as a church. We are not going to do it perfect, but we're going to give it a shot. You know, if you walk in fear, you won't do any of this. And I'm not going to be fraudulent and say, oh, I, you know, yay, that was a great word when it was like, mm, it wasn't. I mean, and I already know all your hearts. Your hearts are for him. Your hearts are for love. Your hearts are for good things, never bad things. So the motives of your heart are never in question. Hear that. The motives of your heart are never in question. Ever. But there are things that join us and have joined us that we haven't had the victory over yet that sometimes want to talk. And that's when, that's when your filter needs to be on. Is this that I'm about ready to say is this, and this isn't just an open mic, this isn't any conversation you ever have. The filter should be on. It's called the God filter, filtering it through the word. Now, I know sometimes you go, well, I'm on a conversation. I can't, I don't have time to do all that. That's why you have the Holy Spirit. He'll, Holy Spirit's on it if you let him be. So again, your motives are never in question, ever. Not in a conversation, not in sharing, anywhere. Ever. But you, as a mature group of people, I didn't say you were in high school yet, maybe middle school. We might have made it there. Some of you, more or less, makes no difference. We learn from each other regardless. We're going we're gonna to do this. And we've been doing it, and we've been doing a really great job. But I really believe God is saying... Maturity needs to take place. So if you feel yourself, whether at a conversation or whether you've come up here or you've been talking to us after whatever, if you feel that for some reason 
you feel rejection or you feel like you're not being heard or you feel um, nobody cares or things like that, know this already. You're listening to a devil. So don't do that. Just don't do that. Save yourself the grief of that. I was really surprised not long ago that someone had said to me that somebody was afraid of me. I just think that's hilarious. It's sad, but it's really funny because I guess I can. I mean, you never know what you, how you appear to someone else. You don't know. You don't, you don't know. I can be pretty intense. I recognize that. I mean, Henry and I had some nose-to-nose conversation that was pretty intense. Trust me. Intensity met intensity. And, and, and I, so I get that I can be. But Henry would always tell me that my dimples flash even then, so therefore I don't even look that intense. So I guess I believed him. But somebody was actually afraid of me. And I'm thinking, why are you afraid of me? I mean, what? I'm kind of like, Paul, I didn't do anything to you. You know, like Henry would always say, he goes, I didn't steal money from you. I didn't rob you. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't punch you. Why are you afraid of me? Like that would, I could understand, you know. But what are you afraid of? And, and so here I am getting to know Paul. <laughs> I get you, Paul. I, I get it. But the fact that anyone would ever be afraid of any of us in the flesh, I can, I, you know, that would be so not right. So then I think, well, then what are, what are they afraid of? Are they, what, what is it in me that they're afraid of? Like, do they think that I'm just going to just tear them down with my words? I mean, I don't go around... I mean, I really, really don't go around tearing people down because I don't believe in it. I want to I wanna uplift people. I want to I do that. So the only thing I can think of is that, well, first of all, they don't know me. But regardless, I don't know all of you either. I know who you are. But I don't, I'm not in a relationship with every one of you. That's not possible. I mean, I, would be, I, I don't know what I'd be doing if that were the case. I would be living at your house and the next person's house, the next person's house. I mean, relationships take time to build. But I have seen you, so it's, you're not acquaintances. I do have some relationships with most of you, some of you not as much as others. But in a relationship, you, you, you find out things about people that you didn't know because you're around them more. Well, regardless of whether or not I'm in a relationship with every one of you at whatever level, my motives to you are the same as yours towards me. I don't want to hurt you. I would only want to lift you up. I only want to build you up. I only want to be what I'm supposed to be as Christ told me to be. That's what I want to be. So why in the world would anybody be afraid? You know? Well, maybe you have people in your life that feel the same way. Maybe they're afraid of you, and you're going like, because I'm going to tell you what, when someone says, I'm afraid of you, and you don't tell me why you're afraid of me, whether, hey, I got a devil and it's, it's screaming, I get that. Or, hey, you know, you slap me across the face and I'm, at, you know, I'm afraid of you. I get that. But not telling someone why they feel that way, to me, is victimization. It's like, I, if you don't give me a chance to fix anything, why are you telling me? Why are they telling you? Hey, I feel really rejected by you. Why? Well, when they tell you why, or they may not tell you why, you know, that... Uh, to me, let's, let's be careful about what we say to one another. Let's be careful how we walk arm to arm. And trust me, if I could, if it was feasibly possible, I would want to know all of you intimately. You might not want me to, but I would. But like Henry would always say, too, he says his, the biggest thing he hated is he didn't know everybody the way he wanted to, whether it was at conferences or whether it was our flock or whatever. And honestly, not that it's not honest, but the last, since 2011, his lifestyle changed dramatically for us. And we had to do certain things. We were in doctor's offices, we were, and he, of course, you know, Henry would always go conferencing. I mean, that's always, he, he loves teaching, 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 teaching. But our lifestyle changed a lot, where it was not even feasible for us, really, honestly, to have and go and visit and see people. 
I know you probably didn't know that, but that's okay. You know, years ago, and I want you to hear this too, because it's, it's not just, I'm not just saying this because it's for me, it's for you. Years ago, I had someone tell me, and it was probably the only good thing they deposited in my life. They said this, you're allowed to eat chicken with whoever you want to. In other words, that means you can be friends with anybody you want. That is your right. You don't have to make excuses for not eating chicken with everybody. And that's for you, too. That doesn't mean that you don't love people. It doesn't mean that at all. So Paul came to this group of people, and honestly, if you read up more, I'm not really sure he knew how he was going to be entreated because he wrote a letter that they didn't like, and he'd heard some things that were said about him. And so he, he was just going to, he was going in faith, believing God sent him, and he did. And so, but, so he showed up on the scene and was greatly rejoicing of how they handled the news that he had sent. How many times have we not done something because we weren't sure how we were really going to be received after we actually followed God's leading and said or did something? I have to say lots of times for me, <laughs> I'm, I'm on that burner. I, I, I've had to say things because I was, I was asked the question. I don't get involved if I'm not asked the question, okay, in a relationship. If I'm not asked a question, I'm not going to impose my thinking on anybody. But if I'm asked the question, what do you think about this? Then I'm, 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 I'm assuming, which you know how that can go, but I'm assuming we're really in a relationship, therefore that's why you asked me, so now I get to tell you whatever it is you've asked of me. Well, you're going to find out if you're in a relationship or not real fast with that if it's something that you don't agree with. My whole reason for wanting to share this today was that, well, there's three actually. First is that God is expecting some maturity out of all of us. Number two, and you already know this, is that you have to do something with the word that you receive. And most oftentimes, it will lead, that word that you've received will lead you to a place where you can repent. You're seeing something, God's convicting you by his spirit, but you, ha but it, but it, you have to do something with that. You have to repent. You can't slap the apologize, I'm sorry, band-aid on top of it and think God's going to be okay. It really means I need to repent. I mean, to acknowledge you know what all those are. And then you have to start walking in a different direction. The third point was that whenever God or the Lord Jesus, I'm the God the Father, Lord Jesus, leadership, ever has to say anything to you that's uncomfortable, it's, it is because he wants to, you to do those first two things. But it is also that you understand his care for you and our care for you. Just as a parent would do. One, one day, this is so true, I hear it often from some of my children, Mom, I repent to you for all that back there, <laughs> okay? I am so sorry. I repent, I repent, I repent. So because it comes, with maturity comes, you look back and you go, oh, I cannot believe. And so that's when you go to the Father and you go, oh, Father, I see it. It might be quick or it might be not quick. But if you remain in a place where you are teachable in your heart, and not taking the position of condemnation by hearing something you don't want to hear, because condemnation is not from God. You know that God loves you. That's why, he, that's why he convicts you, right? He loves you. That's why he convicts you of sin, correct? Correct. So you know the motive of God's heart, don't you? He loves you. That's why he does it. Okay, you can, you're, you're good with that for the most part. But when I talk about people... People, just dust like you, 
having to do the same thing, oftentimes the enemy comes with, with the uh, temptation of feeling condemnation instead of conviction. But the way I look at it is this. You guys are so amazing. I have watched the transition of this body from its, in, in, its inception. I've watched it from the time we had a bobcat on the wall over there, concrete basketball floor, little group of people to learning how to do the open mic, learning so many things, to now I'm standing here saying, you guys get to choose your card. That's a big deal. That's how well you have been doing. So every little humpy bump in the road, don't weigh that against all that you are. I know that none of us are where we want to be, and we're all still going forward. And I hope that someday God drops skits in my brain like he did Henry's. He may. I'm just out there enough it could happen. Um, so Murph, don't get too comfortable. Um, but I really know that Henry was very, very proud of you as a, as a parent to this flock about where you have come. And we're going to keep going in the right direction, no pun intended. Um, I watched his Henryism the other day, Wong right, you know, Wong, sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong. Man, if I had a dollar for every time I've heard that. Now we can just keep, keep playing it. But, um, but anyway, I was very proud of where you are, and I am too, and so is the rest of the elders. And so we're trying not to do too many changes too fast because we're just waiting on God, but this was one that was coming anyway. So here we are. So you guys can give yourself a hug because you're doing great. I really mean that. Give yourself a hug. <laughs> so that is my word for today. I think so. I forgot. We, we didn't talk about the earnest section. Elders, if, if I forget something, remind me. But I think we decided that we're not going to have a section per se. If you need to talk to a pastor, do we, we're, we're going to have him go over to the open mic. I don't remember this part. Is that what we're going to do, David? Yeah, I thought so. Right. So what David is saying <clears throat> is that if you feel like you need the earnest section, which is either you're getting born again or there's some sin that you need to repent of to the body, um, then go to the open mic and tell them, I need, I need, I'm, I'm here for the earnest, and we'll get, a, a, get a, a pastor for you to discuss whatever it is, and then they will come up and do whatever. So did everybody understand that? All right. So earn a section still is working. It's just we don't have a seat for it. You go to the open mic. You say I need I need a pastor for the earn a section. Then they'll and then they'll do that and we'll get somebody to talk with. All right. Okay. You want well, I'll tell you what. Before we do that, we have it closed. Do you, um, we can open the open mic. If you would like to do, if, if there, anybody's got something, on, just flip it over so we can open it. Somebody will have something to say. <clears throat> you are welcome to do so at this time. Is that a prophecy? I never saw that. we got to get rid of that light lavender thing. I couldn't see that from back. I'm, I apologize. Come on up, Dan. The Lord would say, how do you spell my name today? How do you spell my name today? I'll tell you how you spell my name. Take a pencil out. Take a pencil. 
get a pencil in your hand, and I'll tell you how I spell my name today. This is how I spell my name. S-P-O-N-T-A-N-E-O-U-S. That's how I would spell my name today. Do you hear me? S-P-O-N-T-A-N-E-O-U-S. And I'll give you a good word that goes with that. It's in my book of John, and it's chapter 3, verse 8. That is how I want my name to also be known. You know my name in many different ways, but I want you to know my name in that way as well. And that word is, as you can see on your piece of paper, it's a precious word to me. And it's called spontaneous. I love spontaneity. Go for it. Go for it with all your heart as I lead you, as my spirit speaks and leads you. John 3, verse 8. John 3, verse 8 says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whence it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Church, in this time of worldly troubles, do not make any unwise decisions. Lean not on your own understanding, but, but, out, but by every word that comes out of the word of God. For do I not take care of the beast of the field and the fowl of the air? There's, there's something really uh, strong on God's heart this morning for, for you. Um, the Lord would say, I'm a counselor, and I want to counsel you. This is not that you've done anything wrong necessarily or that you've even been far away. I want to remind you that I'm also a counselor, and I've given you my Holy Spirit, and he is a counselor. I want you to sit down with me, with my word, and let me counsel you. I'll teach you all sorts of things. One of the problems that my people have always had, whether it was Israel or whether it's been my church in this new covenant, is that my people love me. They love to worship me. They love the salvation that I've brought to them. But they tend to go other places for counsel. And at times that's grieved me. And I just want you to know, I'm a counselor. Come, let me counsel you in the ways of life. Well, before we move forward, I, I just feel like um, everything that's happened today from Pastor Donna teaching, from all the prophecy that um, has come forth already, that I just wanted to go back over um, something that I taught Friday night because I want to be like Pastor Henry. I just want to keep going over it and over it and over it line after line, 
precept after precept, and for all that, they heard nothing. <laughs> Not you guys. I'm talking about those people that are outside here. Um, but these, these were seven things I talked about that really, I think they even tie into the prophecy that was given today. Most of them do. Some of them may be questionable. But there are seven things here that are for our use to become mature in Christ. Mature in Christ. So this is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. The first one is verse 16, rejoice evermore. It basically is saying don't complain about stuff. You know, take the right attitude that when, when things aren't going well, I can't wait to see how God fixes this. That should be our attitude because either we're going to go down in fear or we're going to, go to, we're going to come up in faith that God is going to fix it for us. Now, this kind of ties in verse 17, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. You know, what this is really talking about is to always have your spiritual antennas up, to be aware that God is with you always and that you should be communicating with him. Because to pray just basically means that you're having a conversation with God. So pray without ceasing. This is something uh, that we're all going to need as we go forward for sure. And then verse 18, it says, And everything give thanks. Thankfulness is, is uh, also really important. It's different than rejoicing. You know, a good example would be when you eat, what do you do? You give thanks for the food, right? So God wants us to have a thankful heart all the time, acknowledging him and thanking him for everything we're receiving. Because, you know, the scripture says every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. And we should acknowledge that. So the third thing is in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So he wants you to have a thankful heart. And then in verse 19, it says, quench not the spirit. And that kind of ties into what Dan was saying uh, when he read that scripture about you don't know where the spirit, you know, comes and goes. What it's really saying there is you don't know where you're going. I'm telling you, you know, my life has just been full of God leading me to places that I would have never gone to. I mean, I can think of so many instances where, you know, I ended up in Kenya, Nigeria. Why? Because God told me to go there. Why did I end up here? Because God told me this is where you, this is where I want you. See, I don't have a right to be where I want to be. I only have a right to be where God has placed me. So when you quench the spirit of God, you're, you're just you're not going to listen. You know, I could have said, I don't want to live in Thomaston, Georgia. I'm used to living in big cities, you know, where you have to wait for an hour to go into a restaurant. Why do that? You can live here and go in and eat, <laughs> you know. But anyway, quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. I know there was a time in this church that people were here and they despised the prophesying. We know, we know what was going on. They did not want to hear certain people get up and prophesy. Many of you, not many, but some of you may understand what I'm, I'm talking about. But I think, the, I think the attitude has changed now. I think it's, it's gotten a lot better about this, you know, listening to the prophecy and let's figure out, hey, 
what's going on here. And uh, verse 21 talks about prove all things. Prove all things hold fast to that which is good. And that goes back to what you were talking about, Pastor Donna, when you said, you know, we all need to study our Bibles. So how, how are you going to prove all things are good without sitting down and diving into the Scripture and allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you into all truth? That's what we all need to be doing, to developing a personal relationship with the totality of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Abstain from all appearance of evil. I think that what this is really saying here is that, you know, you know the difference between good and evil. You all do. Abstain from that. But not only abstain when you know it's evil, but when there's even a question about it and you're not even sure, is this good or evil? You hadn't figured it out yet? Don't do it. Just don't do it until you know whether it's good or evil. I think that's where the enemy can trip us up a lot of times. Uh, if we're not mature enough in the Word to know what's good, what's evil, then just don't do it until you talk to somebody that can help you figure out which side does this thing fall on. So those, those I do believe, again, they tie into to everything we're doing, what you said, what the prophecy was. So if you're going to get to Christian maturity, you're going to need to go back to these verses and make sure that you understand them and you're applying them. And I really believe that that would be a tremendous, another big move forward for the church. Do you agree with Pastor Don? Yep. Okay. All right, well, I think I'm, I'm done. Okay, so we're going to move into the giving part of our service now. So if our ushers will give out our envelopes. You don't have to have an envelope, but we have to give you one. So raise your hand if you want one. And you can use the envelope. You can put a check in it. You can put cash in it. You can write on the outside and use your credit card for your giving. It's up to you. But I am, uh, I'm very thankful for the giving. And I know, you know, God chose this way to support what he's doing in the earth. So it takes the whole body working together to get, the big job that God wants to accomplish done. I mean, it takes, let's face it, it takes a, it takes a lot of, a lot of finances to fulfill because God's got, God's got a big job to do in the earth today. He's got a lot of things he wants to do. And I know when I pray for people, I, a lot of times I'll end with, you know, God would give you the finances just for your own life to do everything he's called you to do. Sometimes I feel like I ought to also pray that he would give you the wisdom not to waste the finances that he's given you so that the enemy doesn't steal part of your journey because you can't do it because your finances aren't able to do it. But God, God wants us to use our money wisely. There's over 2,600 verses in the Bible concerning money. It's the most talked about subject in the Bible. Why? Because it touches every area of your life every day. I mean, every day you got to deal with it. So God wants you to be wise about it. So I pray for all of you that, you know, you dig into the scripture and you'd see, you know, how God wants you to use your finances. I know he's dealing even with me. I'm, you know, thinking about where can I help some people? 
with their finances. So it's not only for for the church, it's, it's for everybody as a body. We would support each other. Sometimes you might be called to help someone. But you can't if you're already up to your head and, you know, in debt. God wants you to be free. If you look in Deuteronomy 28 and you look down starting at verse 15, uh, it, it'll tell you that debt is a curse. It is not a blessing. So I know God doesn't want us to be in debt. There is one debt we should owe, and that's love one another. That's a good debt to owe. So I probably said more than I should have, but consider, and I just ask God really to bless this giving and also to bless you with his wisdom about what he would have you to do with what he has supplied to you. Because everything that you have literally belongs to him anyway. And that's part of, you know, living and moving in the Spirit of God, recognizing that part of your life is under his control. And if it's not, it should be. So I just ask God to bless the offering and to bless you with all wisdom concerning this important subject. So guys, you can go ahead and take up the giving today. I have a song. It just came to me. Let's see if I can remember it. This is my commandment, that ye love one another, that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another, that your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another, that your joy may be full. Yeah. All right, well, with that, I just pray that your week goes wonderful until we meet again. Give someone a hug and a smile as you go. You're dismissed.